Hickman is a guy who is, I think, uniquely suited to do those big events, to, to chart out a way where all of these stories can take place, where everyone can feel like they have a moment, where everything thematically is kind of pulling in the same direction and you can land a really good ending. For any occasion, so keep patent out waiting. Comics and conversation, keep the conversation moving along. Keep reading comics, keep your local store strong. If it's hard, then it's a job for the challenger. Comics and conversation, y'all. From Challengers Comics and Conversation in Chicago, this is Contest of Challengers. And now, here are Patrick Brower and W. Dal Bush. So, you have no recollection of it? No, I'm gonna go to Combo Database to see if I can find out how long it took for this Superman Unchained book to come out. Because, yeah, it rings virtually no bells. Like, when you were describing it to me, in increments, Scott Snyder, Jim Lee, Superman, all I could think was, like, are you confusing the Jeff Johns, John Romita Jr. Superman (laughs) run? Like, I remember that. That was okay. He got his, like, Nova Burst power or whatever. He did, uh, which he's never used since. No, the, the... I, I'm sure he's used it in, like, a story, but I know that the Supergirl TV show used it for an episode or two. There we go. Superman Unchained. How many? Nine issues. Yeah, nine, so nine issues. Okay, so it was running super late. That make, I guess Jim Lee's art makes no what? surprise. It came out between August 2013 and January 2015. That's to do nine issues. It took them about 17 months to do nine issues. <laughs> It's bi monthly. I get. I mean, it wasn't supposed to be. Well, sure. Like but... it was. It was monthly for the first three. Then it became. They skipped November and then to December and January. Then it took them three months for another issue to come out, and then it was basically like three to four months between issues. I'm not positive, but I think that might have been one of their first director's cut books as well. Maybe getting a, a Scott Snyder script. Well, let me ex- see if I can expand on this. I'm not seeing a director's cut, but maybe it's listed someplace else. Okay, so the reason we're talking about Superman Unchained Uh is because... They did a director's cut, you're right. Okay. Is because... And and I'm talking to the the listener, not not to you. Okay, good. Is because Dow was explaining Batman Last Night on Earth to me Uh and was comparing it to Alan Moore's Superman... Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow. And I said, oh, Superman of Tomorrow... You mean that Scott Snyder series? Because I was confusing Unchained with... I thought it was called Man of Tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like... Uh, and, he, and you thought I meant yeah, something that, else. Then we slid right down the rabbit hole. And, and then <laughs> I started describing it. I'm like, there's chains? He's breaking yeah. chains on the cover? It was Jim Lee? And... So he, Patrick's mentioning this, and I'm just thinking, okay, you're confusing it with the Jeff Johns thing. I don't think Scott Snyder and Jim Lee ever did a Superman book together. I feel like I'd remember that. So I picked up my phone, and I went into Google, and I searched... Scott Snyder, Jim Lee, and, like, up pops, like, Superman Unchained. And I told Patrick the title, and then I'm like, what is this book? <laughs> and it, it it only came out in 2013. It came out, you know, six years ago. Yeah. And I have no recollection of it, and nobody asks about it, and no one talks about it, which feels super strange and, like, such a, a testimonial to how weird the industry is now that something like that could exist and was published for 17 months. And because of how much stuff is in the industry and how quickly culture moves, it might as well have never even been published. Clearly it had long-lasting repercussions on the Superman mythos, and things were never the same. One main thing is that it's a New 52 Superman book, so it basically never existed, thanks to their continuity. So it becomes a book that no one's going to go looking for because it's irrelevant to the ongoing Superman narrative. But it's it's not just Superman. It's something I don't know if we've talked about it on the podcast before, but I I have mentioned it to a few customers when talking about how weird uh, the market is now and how big the market is and how much stuff comes out. I I've been redoing the back issues, which thankfully I finished a couple weeks ago, and I was grateful to be done with that. And they're great. Uh, they were great. They're probably not as great anymore. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the the quick, day I was done, they probably became less. A great. quick sidebar: Gina was describing the back issues to someone, mm-hmm. and she's like, "They're alphabetical by title." For the most part, there's probably some messed up in the middles. And I said, we just read it all of those. Yeah. Dell worked so hard. It doesn't matter. I filed some stuff maybe a week after I'd completely finished it. And I was filing into the middle of the alphabet books that I'd worked on two or three weeks prior. Meticulously, diligently. Yeah, book by book. 
and hands bleeding. There was already like a, some of these issues are out of order all of a sudden, which was epidemic as I was working on them. You you'd get people who eight sequential issues would be two and then five and then three and then one and then f four and then six through eight. And it's like, how did you do this? How did someone almost by hand go in and, and disorganize them? But I was noticing chunks of comics where it's like, oh, this goes in a completely different box. Someone was looking through them and just plugged them in someplace else. Um, I've always liked the idea of having an empty box that just says, hey, if you're done looking, put it here. Yeah. But that doesn't look good, and there's nowhere well, to put it. And and on top of that, I don't want to be dismissive of humanity, but no one reads any signs. Yeah, that's So true. they would that, that would mean they noticed it, realized they were about to do something that we didn't want them to do, and chose to not do that thing. When I know the process of people who go through the back issues, and that's not how their brains work. Uh, one of the things I noticed... Dal, come on. It's not just the back issues. It's graphic novels, too. Yeah, it's the alphabet. And single issue comics. One, one of the things, things I noticed, noticed as I was going through the back issues was I'd, I'd be thinning them out and I'd be reorganizing things. And occasionally I'd come to a series and I'd think, oh my gosh, I forgot this existed. One of them was... Superman Unchained. Uh, no, we don't have any back issues of that, or maybe I'd remember it. Uh, Morning Glories. Oh yeah? Uh, Nick Spencer. Nick Spencer, Joe Eisma. 50 issues. That book was out for over five years. And well, it's like it never existed. We don't carry the graphic novels... Nobody asked for the graphic novels. There's no interest. Like, it basically disappeared. And that was a book that was fairly popular at Image. Again, it ran about five years. Yeah. Well, if you remember, it got really late toward the end. Sure, there were and gaps. And it was so the book a year off. <laughs> that made Nick Spencer. Like, that was what made him a name. Sure. But by the end of it, we were club only. Right. But, I mean, that's the case with, with Image Comics by issue three for some of them. Um, yeah, that's true. But again, this thing, industry-wide, ran long enough that they could have 50 issues, I think like 10, 10 or so graphic novels, a couple compendiums, hardcovers. Like, yeah, I, yeah. There was clearly a market at some point for this. I'm, I'm but, sure. But now that it's been over for like maybe four years or so, it's like it disappeared off the face of the earth. It disappeared off the face of Challengers. I'm sure... Other stores still stock. Are it. you sure? I I would. They restock it. They I order would guarantee. It. If they I sell bet, it, they reorder it. I bet there's a store that like it's one of their best sellers. Right, but a store. Yeah. Do you think enough stores? I can't imagine. Oh, I don't know about case. enough, but yeah, something. It's just weird how that happens, where so much stuff just kind of disappears from the conversation so quickly. Like, I don't expect that we'll ever not carry Saga. If if we're open for another fifteen years, I imagine we'd still have people coming in saying. What's good? And we'd go, have you ever read Saga? Or sure. people who are like, oh, I was experiencing this, you know, Fiona Staples' newest work. What else has she done? And we go, oh, did you ever read Saga? I mean, we don't stock as many quantity of the six gun as we used to, but we still stock them sure. all. Because it still sells. Yeah. Like, a lot of the reason we stopped carrying Morning Glories was at a point, no one was discovering it. No one was picking up volume one off the rack and saying, oh, I want to see what this series is like. It's like the whole country just sort of moved on from a period where they would sample it or experience it, and then they just decided no in favor of these newer things. And that happens all the time. I, it, it was just weird to see that book in the back issues and have to remind myself, you carried every issue of this that, that existed while Challengers was open. Yeah. You carried every graphic novel for a while. You sold copies of this. People had it on their subscription list, and now yeah, it, it it's like it just disappeared into the ether. It wasn't a terrible subscription number. It was uh, what, like 12 or so? Sure, maybe. Something? It was something I where it was I think it got down to like 6 or 8 toward the end. Yeah, like a lot of series that run that long. It it, it starts to peter out a little bit, but still, yeah. It, it's amazing to me the amount of stuff where you and I know a lot about the industry and we remember a lot about books that came out. <laughs> well, that's all the time. Well, because it's hard to, because there's so much of it, and we're seeing the effects of that, where it's like, oh, this is not something that is relevant to contemporary publishing, so eventually we sort of forget about it. Like, if no one's asking about it, no one's talking about it, yeah, it just goes away. And and that can be something that was, you know, a six-issue series, or something that ran for five years, within the last decade. Yeah. And it's just, yeah, might as well not exist. So weird. I feel bad for those creators that stuff like that happens, where you feel like you're doing something that has some longevity to it. It ran 50 issues, right? Like, you've got some hardcovers and some softcovers, and people are going to discover those. No. Might as well have never been published. Whatever money you've made off of it, done. 
So strange. Yeah, I can't imagine any of it goes back to press at, no. at, at, at a time. Yeah, I gotta assume anyone at Image who sees like Volume Four sell out is gonna be like, we can go back to press, but I, the sales velocity on this, you're never gonna make that money back. Uh, we have heard stories of Image going to creators saying, "Hey, we're gonna liquidate your book. Mm -hmm. We we are tired of storing it, so you can either buy it from us." Or we're burning it. Yeah. One of the Lunar Brothers had that happen recently. It was kind of a, a little bit of a fiasco because it was not a good look uh, for a publisher to do that. But, I mean, not to defend when a publisher does that, but a lot of it is because it costs money to store that stuff one way or another. Brian Boland had that happen with his image art book. Yeah. And he posted about it on his Facebook page mm -hmm. and said, hey, if anybody wants it, you should you can get it at these blowout prices. And he, he had a link. Mm-hmm. So I went to the link, and I, I said, hey, we'll take X number of copies of that. And I got a reply back saying, uh, this isn't for you. Yeah, that's for creators. That's yeah. what it costs creators to get it. Yeah. But I thought, isn't it at least still money? I guess I not. But, uh, on the grand scheme of things, I'm sure they know what their product and their time is worth. Mm -hmm. We, however, do not know what our time is worth because it turns out this very episode, episode number 435 of Contest of Challengers, a... Comics Industry Business Podcast on the Yak Channel Podcast Network. This is our 10th year anniversary episode. Hey, happy anniversary. And happy anniversary to you. I thought it was at the end of August. I was wrong. It's the beginning of August, apparently. And it was the end of July, July 31st. Oh no, we missed it. And, well, no, I told you about it on the day of. Yeah, but we didn't record on that We day. didn't. Well, I mean, we could have, but you said, no, I don't care. It's not worth it. I didn't say Let's that. Quit. I said, I don't care about anyone. That's true. So all of the grand plans I had for the 10th anniversary, I didn't do. I was going to do them over, slowly over the course of August. Whoops. So no sound bites from every existing episode. So uh, we're doing a contest of challengers, uh, which is a semi-regular series we're going to do for the new website, which is basically just one of us uh, talking to a person who shows up at the counter, which today is me talking to Patrick Brower, who's showing up at the counter. Why, hello, W. Dublish. How are you today? Wow. Which, by the way, was ridiculous in its scope anyway. Yeah, boy, that's that's at least 500 episodes, right? In fact, it would have been... 604 episodes. 520 episodes had we been weekly from the start. But which, we took some we breaks. Were. We are 85 episodes behind where we would have been if we did it weekly. Mm -hmm. But who's counting? Uh, also, you, you just did. Also... <laughs> You're counting. The episode, like the, the podcast that I always judged ours against mm -hmm. that came out s just shortly after ours and never missed a week... Colt Cabana's Art of Wrestling. Hey, congratulations. You're listening to Contest of Challengers, but this is Colt Cabana, and I also do a podcast. It's called The Art of Wrestling. It's on iTunes. comes out every single Thursday. After listening to this, go on over and listen to mine. Thanks. Is winding down. Oh. He's coming to an end. Well. He's been doing it for nine years. I don't blame him. Yeah, I, I mean, I. it's hard to... to quantify a reaction like that because on the one hand i want to be like no but on the other hand having done like a weekly podcast yeah okay <laughs> yeah i mean ten, i can understand that decision <laughs> uh, 11 plus years of challengers is one thing but 10 years of this podcast uh-huh 10 years man 10 10 years 10 years 10 10 years 10 years it's insane to me that it is a thing that is still going, and that people find value in it, but they do. So who are we to say anything? Oh, people that have a podcast who are supposed to talk for like an hour a week. I guess. Yeah, there there is that. So anyway, 10th anniversary, the 10th anniversary podcast quiz, not going to happen. And the episodes, uh, the, the previous sound bites. Not going to happen. In fact, I had a couple of soundbite drop-ins I was going to put in last week, mm -hmm. but we never broached their subjects, and oh. I thought just adding them in sure. wouldn't make sense. One was Marty DeRosa from Marty and Sarah Love Wrestling talking about how much he loves Saga because you got him into it. Oh, hey. I've been reading Saga, the graphic novel, yeah. the comic in graphic novel form. It is so amazing. You're lit up over it. But I can't even begin to tell you I'm on... The third 
graphic novel in the series. Of I'm on the first nine. One. It is unfreaking believable. Every time I go to Challengers, I would see it, and every once in a while, I go, oh, recommend something. They've rec- they've given me some great recommendations. Mm-hmm. Sex Criminals is awesome. I'm reading the the new Watchmen DC crossover thing, which is great as well. And every once in a while, I go, what's this saga? And uh, Dal there was like, that's great. You got to read it. And I was like, all right. And I read it, and it was like, as soon as I read the first one, I was like, oh no. I I knew right away. I was hooked. Yeah. Like right, and I told you, I'm like. The and world I'm, building, I'm the characters. After you. <laughs> it's so awesome. So check out Saga. And another was from uh, the Cartoonist Kayfabe mm-hmm. podcast. It was a, a video interview where they're talking to Scotty Young at Heroes Con, and he talked about my involvement in his career, which he always overemphasizes. Neat. That guy was going to be discovered no matter what. Sure. I went to the comic book shop one day and I was just like, oh, you know, I, you know, you try to do that thing like, I draw. You don't even know what you're trying to get out of it. You're just trying to express to somebody that you like drawing. And it happened to be Pat, Patrick Brower, who owns Challengers. And he was like, oh, cool, I ink and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then it happened to be up there at the time where this, uh, his name is Joe Curry. And he was an indie publisher. Like, he was self published in Chicago. And he's like, Joe publishes comic books. Well, you guys will get along. Uh, it's very kind of him, though, to, to mention me. In uh, in that capacity, the same way it's kind of me to mention you. Hey, Dev. Hey, Patrick. Well, that was it. It's our mention. Oh, thanks. I'm going to include that sound clip on my retrospective for the 11th anniversary of the Contest of Challengers Comics Industry Business Podcast. Oh, not Contest of Challengers. Uh, no, I had to shudder that. I sued myself. Oh, did you get any money? No, because I knew that I had no money, so I was able to settle very easily with just a simple cease and desist. Okay, well, uh, we actually do get money monthly from patrons, and since it is the start of a new month, it is. this August is the point even. where we say, hey, thank you, patrons, and specifically, thank you, Christina McChrystal, Jacob Sorelli, Robert Lane, Morgan Kaiju Perry from Boom Studios, my brother George Brower. Artie White, whose birthday was yesterday, when we're recording. Michael Romanenko, who we do have a question from from this week, because we had to ask him what it was, because we both forgot last week, and we'll definitely get to it. The Springham family, Jose Villagomez, who was in today. Tom Ngovin from Century Guild and uh, movies like Aurora and other stuff he makes out in California now. Mitchell Davies from All Star Comics in Melbourne, Australia. Mike Lee. Ryan Alcock. Matt Armstrong. And two brand new patrons for this month. Two, you must have miscounted. I know, right? Oh, yeah, comics. Mark Hammond, Brother Bear. And uh, my longtime close personal friend and brutally frank creator, also. One half of the divorce gun, Robert Burns. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. We did it. So that was it, right? That was our week. We're we're good. Yeah, we're done. Thanks for listening. Okay. Keep around. Uh, I, I I will mention that Dad was telling me about some Walgreens Funko Pop Spider Man exclusives that they have that sounds super fun. Or I guess will have in the future. They announced them today, which means they probably will be out at Walgreens in the next three months. Spider Man with Doctor Octopus arms. Future Foundation, the white costume Spider-Man, and the amazing Bagman. Mm-hmm. That looks so cute. Yeah, pretty good. I like it. Shall we jump into Michael's question, or shall I deal with this piece of paper in my hand? You make the call, Coach. Oh, I need to write down what we're talking about so I can write this easier. Let's answer uh, Michael Romanenko's question, since we forgot to do it last week. Okay. And he had asked... The same question, but to us as retailers and then as comic fans, the best company event. Yeah, the best like event comic for us as fans or successful event comic as retailers. Like, how did it do for us financially? Well, I'll, ju- I'll go if you want me to go. Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to start as a fan, mm-hmm. and I'm going to go back to my childhood, my, my youth, mm-hmm. if you will. If you say Millennium, so how And me. say Invasion <laughs> from DC... No. Manhunter... No. The original 
Marvel Super Heroes Secret Wars. Really? That story is one of the first times that a major company crossover... Well, it, first of all, it was a year-long event. Sure. It had everybody in it. And you were reading it month to month, I assume. Yes. And it had major repercussions... For a lot of characters. So which Marvel books were you reading when it started? Because the big deal for that series, which people may not know, is that when Secret Wars came out, all of the aftermath events of Secret Wars happened before the series really started. Yeah, and you had to read the series to find out how. Yeah. You'd, you'd be reading an issue of Spider-Man, and oh, Spider-Man swings in a Central Park, and there's this weird structure, and he goes in it. The next issue of Spider-Man, he jumps out of it in a black costume with Kirk Connors, and you're like, what's going on? Yeah. And the whole thing is, like, you'll find out over the next year's worth of Secret Wars comics. Same thing for, like, FF. They go in, they come out, Ben's not with them, and she helps on the team. member, yeah. So which of those were you reading? Like, which... which? Okay, so this is going to tie into what you are talking about a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. about the... Not remembering comics anymore. The huge <laughs> amount of products out now. Sure. Because I can absolutely tell you all of them. Well, you, I was reading every Marvel comic back then. Do you remember, I mean, just top of your head, uh, the range of, like, how many Marvel comics might come out in a week back in 1984, 85? Uh, I don't remember specifically, but it was enough that I could read them all. Like a dozen, maybe? Sure. I mean, oh, less than that per week? Per week, yeah. yeah. So not even, like, 12 per week? I don't think... And, and I don't you think were getting was... every Marvel Universe title? Yeah. Okay. Not every... just every Marvel Universe, every Marvel book, every epic. So really? Yeah. Okay, Wow. Every, um, like, you got Star Wars? Yeah. Wow, okay. I, I got Transformers. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I have, you somebody, know, somebody dug all up, the new universes. Uh, somebody for a podcast I listened to, uh, Transformers University, I think is the podcast. Uh, a guy named Anthony Brucalli from New York is basically going through, like, year by year to kind of set, like, what was Transformers like then? And I think he did a thing where he dug up the first ever review for a Transformers comic. Yeah. And it was 84. Um, and it was just basically by someone who, who reviewed Marvel comics on, like, the the pre-internet message board days. And it was uh, not complimentary. Like, for someone who was reading Marvel comics, it was like, this is not good. Sure. <laughs> this is bad. This is not going to last. Uh, I read G.I. Joe regularly. Okay. Yeah. That makes a little bit more sense for someone who reads Marvel comics, because, I mean, what Larry Hama was doing on that was probably not a million miles away from an issue of, like, Avengers. A regular superhero book, yeah. sure. Sure. But going back to Secret Wars... Sure. It was self-contained, as in there weren't a million miniseries. Like, mm -hmm. can you imagine if they were doing that today? They did. How many... Well, they, sure, they took over but, their entire publishing line for, like, five months. Yeah, and, and <laughs> how many... Unnecessary crossovers and tie-ins sure. and miniseries and yeah, oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah, like that was it was a twelve-issue series and yet there were like it did cross over into the other books, but in the most organic way possible. So set this up for me as as someone who was not reading superhero comics religiously back then. Yes, when you were reading an issue of Amazing. Like, did you have any idea that the next one was going to be black costume stuff? Like, I assume no, you were reading no, not at all. Marvel Age. Were they talking about it in there at all? Marvel Age talked about things that were happening at the at the same time. Okay. Like, it wasn't a look that far in the future. Okay. So you you were like... Man, I you, was so into the Marvel handbook and Marvel... I, I, yeah, sure. I had every Marvel Age, yeah. Sure. So, I mean, you as a fan came to it totally cold. Like, yeah. you, you picked up an issue of Spider-Man and you're like, holy crap, what is this costume? It's so rare that a Marvel story would say, you know, assassination plot, one of six. Mm -hmm. Like, oh man, you know this is like six issues. You didn't know how long stories went. They, sure. they just went forever. It That's was an nice issue. It's funny sometimes when people ask for, like, collections of, like, Chris Claremont X-Men storylines from the 1970s and 80s, and it's like... Nothing was a discrete storyline. So, things just rolled into each other all the yeah, time. Yeah, and if you notice, one of the things about Claremont is that A, major change happened all the time. Sure. B, his team lineup was always in flux. It was never just this core group. Yeah. Somebody was... Cyclops was gone. Wolverine was gone. Kitty Pride was there. Storm is back. Cyclops is back. Wolverine is gone again. Like, there was never... Like, you... As soon as you think, like, oh, this is... It's these five people... No, then someone's not there. Yeah. 
Which, it's such a... Eventually, you'd get a lineup where it was, like, Strong Guy and Moira McTaggart and Polaris, but she had, like, Super Strength and Forge. Sure. <laughs> and, like, the cop from New Mutants or whatever. But that's, like, what's that's going why on? Avengers was the one book that would be like, all right, the roster change issues were always such a big deal because sure. they held with a, a seven-member roster for a while, but no one else does that. Thanks, and now, Henry Peter Gyrich, you jerk. Right? What a jerk. Now they announce a team book, and you got to read eight issues before all those characters appear together, sure. and then they immediately break up, and somebody else comes in. Yeah, Doctor Strange is on the, the Avengers for a storyline, and now he's gone. Yeah, now it's Savage Avengers, for a while. you know, Damien Hellstorm and Black Widow. Uh huh. So anyway, so Secret Wars, we talked about the effects in the other books, but how how did you find the actual miniseries? Like, what was that experience like? Gripping. Yeah. Because there were like cliffhangers, things happened all the time. Uh, just the idea of it was Rhodey who was in the Iron Man armor and no one else knew it. And there was a point where he had to take off his glove to cannibalize it for something. And people were like, holy shit, that dude is black. <laughs> I'm sure in a totally sophisticated, not weird way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm sure. Exactly. 1985, 84? Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I mean, you know, it, it, it was all done by Mike Zach who... You know, the was killing himself by the end of it. Uh, sure, Jesus. but also such a like he was a huge one of Captain America. Yeah, I, and, love, I love Mike Zach. Right, right. I mean that that was like oh my god that that's when you first got the idea of oh you put an A list talent on this book. Sure, and then Secret Wars two just pissed that all away. But the point is that book had like it was it showed me what events could and erroneously were going to be for a while but not forever sure i can see that for me as a fan i mean i read a lot of event stuff growing up for sure um by the point that i was reading comics religiously superhero comics anyway it was already kind of codified into every summer this happens yeah not my favorite for sure uh the the Biggest one I remember as a kid was definitely Infinity Gauntlet. Okay. Uh, that was the one where it was, you had no idea what was going on. They kill half the universe in the first issue. What's left is just these this weird-ass group of characters. It was not necessarily all headliners. They were bringing back characters that I'd never read before, like basically all the, uh, the Warlock cast, like Adam yeah. Warlock and Pip the Troll and Gamora. Like, I never yeah. read any of Starlin stuff. I, I read his Silver Surfer stuff, but not his original... Like head trip stuff, so I remember that being a big deal. I, I think story wise, the two that work the best for me, and I haven't reread them in a while, so maybe I'd feel differently if I reread them now. Secret Invasion, uh, Secret Invasion and Siege, obviously, because Brian Bendis is the best at big events. Uh, no, the two that work the best for me are probably Jonathan Hickman's Infinity and the Avengers versus X Men storyline. Um, I remember at a time where those Marvel events were definitely seeing. Um, diminishing returns since Civil War, those were the ones that I was like, God damn, like, this actually works as a story front to back. Uh, Avengers X-Men had some of the best artistic talent um, rotating around in really creative, fun ways. Uh, the mix of those those big A-list Marvel architect writers like Jason Aaron and Brian Bendis and Ed Brubaker and uh, Matt Fraction and Hickman, like, it, it felt like the biggest story that you could tell at a time when Marvel was firing on all cylinders. Infinity, though, I think is maybe the one I'd probably pick as, as my favorite as a fan, because that's the one... Hickman is a guy who is, I think, uniquely suited to do those big events, to, to chart out a way where all of these stories can take place, where everyone can feel like they have a moment, where everything thematically is kind of pulling in the same direction, and you can land a really good ending. Like, Infinity is a book. You get that big, thick graphic novel... It just, I think it tells a really complete story, and it's got a, a fun sort of dynamic to the the Avengers all go out into space to do this story, and then everybody left on Earth has to fight Thanos and his guys, and then it all just kind of dovetails in the end. So I think the Infinity is probably the one that I think okay. is my favorite event. Obviously, I have a decade of reading on you. You do. So I, I, I mean, I've, I've gone back and read all those stories at some sure, point. Sure, sure, sure. But I, I still I, have fondness for... You know the the ones you were making fun of. Like earlier. what? 
What millennium? Uh, sure. You're gonna fly the flag for millennium? No, I'm just saying I have. Come a, on. I have a fondness for it. <laughs> I, what a, what fondness? Invasion, Joe like Staten? I said. <laughs> hey man, Joe Staten. The new Guardians. Joe Staten did. He was the regular Green a- Green Lantern artist for a while. Yeah, before they got someone good like Pat Broderick there, I'll say it. <laughs> Mark Bright, come on, man. I'm saying if that's what you're used to, it's it's fine. I suppose. I mean, Don Heck was the Avengers artist when I was reading Avengers. I'm not going to ask you to apologize for your childhood, but I'm going to say Man Millennium, really. <laughs> but all all of those like those sure. and, and Invasion. And, I, I and like Invasion that- a lot. I do. Uh, Todd McFarlane just before he he took off for D, for Marvel for good. Uh, Bart Sears, yeah, man, I like Invasion. The Dominators, the Dominators, sure. sure. Uh, what was that? And it's three issues. It's just three big issues. Yeah. I like that. I like when it's like over in a summer. Sure. What was that? John Ostrander, John Byrne one. Legends. Yeah, Legends. Legends is great. Yeah. Stuff like that. Suicide Squad. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, I. I think the more modern ones are ones that I'd have a harder time, and maybe it's because I lack the lens of nostalgia on them. But a lot of the ones that are, like, post-2000, it's just really hard to say, like, yeah, Siege was good. I don't know that Siege was good. Like, I like the art on it. Like Olivia Quipa a whole lot. One of my all-time faves. But it's just, it's a four-issue series that... I, I think the problem with a lot of modern events is that I they just feel like they matter for about four months, and then they don't matter right. anymore. Right. These other these other events that we're talking about had such depth to them. Yeah. Uh, what was the one where everybody got hammers? Oh, God. It was uh, Fraction we, we, and Emo, yeah, we, right? Fear Itself. Fear Itself. Yeah, I feel I like we were just talking about this yeah. recently we also couldn't come up with a name for it. Right. Right. And and you, Matt Fraction, Stuart Eminem, A plus A equals yeah. A plus, right? Hysterically, uh, Fear Itself was part of a bet that we had that uh, I thought Flashpoint would outsell it and you thought Fear Itself would outsell Flashpoint and you were right. And yet we can't remember the name of Fear Itself. That was the mustache bet? That was a mustache bet. Oh, wow. Yeah. We had uh, Brian Azzarello, who was working on the Flashpoint Batman book at the time, who knew what Flashpoint was leading up to. He put a hand on my shoulder and assured me that I would win the bet. And then I didn't. (laughs) I lost. (laughs) But I was too gracious and let you off the hook way too early. I suppose, yeah. For anyone who is is not old enough to remember this, uh, the bet was that whoever lost would have to grow a mustache. But just a mustache. But just a mustache. You couldn't grow the full beard and then shave it to down, down to a mustache. You had to start with just the mustache. And this is a point where I didn't even entertain the, the idea of having facial hair. Right. Uh, and and the conclusion of the penalty was the, the person who won got to determine when you were, when the loser was allowed to shave it. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm... At one point, a photo existed of me with the the crappy mustache. There's there's two photos. Okay, it probably still does. Uh, I rem- those photos were taken in uh, dim lighting in a restaurant. I think. Yes, yeah, yeah, in 2011. That's yeah. how how well, that's the time period we're talking about. Yeah. Well, I mean, Flashpoint was the pre New Fifty Two. Yeah. Which is why Azarello was certain that we were and and I mean New Fifty Two was a huge deal. People did not go back and read Flashpoint because of it. And look, when we used to do our point counterpoint. Uh, written column in a different life mm-hmm. it's the same way somebody has to take one side and takes the other yeah so it, it, it wasn't like it was just a matter of like well okay i'll take that one yeah it wasn't like no i'm, I'm gonna die on this hill it's like no okay i I'll, like i was virtually assigned yeah fear itself it was just fun to do yeah of course i think it started with a kind uh, of not a disagreement but it was a thing where like we were talking about the two events and i was like the flashpoint's gonna do way better fear itself does not feel like a, a cohesive idea in the way that Flashpoint does. Um, but what we had not understood at the time was that, oh yeah, DC sales are completely in the toilet, which is why they're rebooting their entire universe. Yeah. That's going to translate into the amount of people who want to buy a DC event versus Marvel, which has a lot more fans that will just buy whatever the big event for the year was until that stopped being tenable. And you hated growing that mustache so much. Yeah, I, I'm not good so at it. So much. It, it looked fine. It just never got... To be full enough because I let you off the hook. Also, like, the way my facial hair grows in, it just, it never thickens up, really. I mean... It just keeps growing out. You don't... The hairs you, are too you far You never apart. let, like, I never, I thought the same thing about mine. Uh-huh. And you were right. Look at how sure. far apart all those I hairs know. are. I bet. You know, Inches. If you analyze it, it's not great, but I no, think it works. No, it's good. I'm kidding. I think it works. I'm I, kidding. I also think you, you could have a much better uh, outcome than you expect. Well, I'm not going to risk it. 
Uh, anyway, so Sales part potential. two is what, and this is this is no longer a from our childhood. This is from Challenger's yeah, experience. 2008 to August 2nd, 2019. What was the biggest crossover success story? Yeah, I didn't crunch any numbers for this. This is definitely going to be anecdotal. Uh, I mean, at this point, I don't know if it counts House of X. <laughs> Maybe House of X. Yeah. It's it's having a tremendous impact on our bottom line. And just subscription I, I numbers alone, I don't think we've ever had an event that had this kind of subscription uh, numbers. Ever. Uh, yes, but I think even though we're using the word event... Yeah, you wouldn't, I, you wouldn't qualify this. Yeah, I, I think that that's, it's disqualified. That's fair. Uh, so obviously you're going to change to House of M. Were we open when House of M was coming out? I don't remember. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, I the think first one we were open for, I'm pretty sure, was, was Secret, Secret Invasion. Invasion. Yeah, because I remember stocking those issues in the early days. Because we went, no offense to AEW, all in on Secret Invasion. We did, and that was when we learned that oh, we don't have that kind of a fan base for this. Yeah, I mean, as a side note, one of the early lessons we learned um, when we were opening Challengers was that we were ordering like a more uh, mature store, and we of were a brand new store. store. Yeah, and as a result, we drastically overordered the first few months and. Would not make that mistake again. To be fair, I think that those numbers is what we would probably do now. Right, but that's year 11. Yeah. We were doing it in year one, yeah. which was a huge mm-hmm. mistake. Mm-hmm. Anyway. I think, and again, I haven't crunched these numbers either. Uh-huh. Just from sheer scope, uh huh. the Hickman Secret Wars. Yeah, maybe. It definitely had a good Halo effect. There were a lot of those tie-in books that I would not have expected people to jump onto and they did um it's a combination of the main series doing really well it really did and they're just so goddamn many yeah crossovers and tie-ins and one shots and mini series and you name it nowadays mostly do terrible we took a bath on war of the realm stuff so much so that if people expect to see a bunch of absolute carnage tie-in series on our racks let me assure you you will probably not see that many yeah, of them. You will definitely not. If you're looking to read them, I would definitely sign up for them because I'm not sticking my neck out again for one of these Marvel things. Yeah, I, I feel like probably that. Maybe AVX. You uh, know that that definitely had a lot of juice behind it. It was twelve you, issues, it was coming out real fast. Sure. We had we did a, a midnight open for it. Um Man, I can't even remember all the midnight opens we were doing. We did we did I really one for wish that. I really wish we did one for House of X. It's just that you and I somehow never, either of us, never saw that it was a thing we could do. Yeah. Yeah, and like a lot of those, like, if I feel like people are, like, if someone asks for it, then I know that there's an awareness and a, and it's a desirable event. I'm more likely to do it. What, by the time we talked about it, it was literally the day of, and it's like, well, it's too late now. Like, yeah. how do we even promote this? Who would even see it? Right. We would gotten us a handful of people, yeah. but not worth the the effort involved and most of the ones who come in at midnight would just come in the next day anyway right it's not like we were only getting midnight people when we have time to promote it we do pull from other stores because of people that don't want to wait sure yeah and again it didn't seem like anyone else in the neighborhood was doing it so uh maybe my, there my was point not interest. with uh how often you're going back to avx is almost superman unchained like i don't remember it uh, I, I remember we did a, a fun crossover promotion with Chicago, Chicago Comics, Comics, but we didn't actually do anything. No, it was just like a weird social media thing that, of yeah. course, people took too seriously right away. And it was like, well, that's no fun now. Yeah. And we were going to, uh, like the mustache bet, mm-hmm. one store was going to pick Avengers, one store was going to pick X-Men. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't like there was a clear-cut victor. Yeah. Not Professor Xavier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> But it all yeah. worked out for him in the end anyway, so it's fine. Yeah, I, I think AVX is really solid as a series and I think as as a sales thing. For a lot of people who are kind of trying to, to metagame the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I think a lot of people assume that eventually they're going to do a big Avengers versus X-Men event because even in the comics, it just feels like a way to print money. Like sure, the but... idea of putting those two franchises... And the X-Men weren't, like, a diminished, shitty franchise by that point. They were still really strong. But you have to reintroduce all those Avengers that are gone. Well, I don't think it'll necessarily be that... I guess spoilers. Well, I don't think it'll be that Avengers, necessarily. I think there will be an Avengers franchise from the Marvel Cinematic Universe versus an X-Men franchise. Yeah, but then don't you feel like that's almost uh, a cop-out? Like, oh, no, we want to see Iron Man and Thor and Captain America against... 
Cyclops and Jean Grey and Wolverine and Colossus? Well, three things. One, I don't know if people will necessarily feel that way in ten years. Um, they'll have new fa- uh, new heroes that they're fans of, new cinematic icons that they want to see. Team oh, with. Rasputin. They'll all move on. Um, two. With all the weird time travel stuff they've done in these movies before, it's entirely possible if they wanted to, they could contrive a reason to throw a big bag of money at Chris Evans, DH his face by 10 years, and plug him right back in like he never left. Third, my theory long term is that eventually they will do a new Captain America, a new Iron Man. Yeah, they'll recast. They'll just, it'll be like James Bond or Batman. Right. They'll just be a new guy. Sure. So, how many Spider-Mans have there been, you know? Four. At least. Did, Did you... you- Go, go on. I, I think we're going to say the exact same thing. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Nicholas Hammond. Did not even figure that nope. out. Was reading the thing nope. then. I'm like, he was in that movie? Uh, I like that we were both yeah. immediately doing the same thing. He was basically playing the weird Robert Evans role. <laughs> there were so many people in that movie that I did not realize who were in it until sure. after the fact. I think it's... Su- Brenda Vaccaro was in that movie. I think it's definitely suitable for that movie for it to be full of, like, washed up Hollywood people... Being revitalized, not only because Tarantino's been doing that since his first and second movies, but also because it's kind of what the movie's about. Black Lightning's Gambi was in the movie. Yeah. Not as a tailor. No, he was a cowboy man, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think half the people were cowboy mans. Yeah, but he specifically was a cowboy man. So, are you giving the most successful event to AVX or to... Secret Wars, or... I'm probably going to give it to AVX, because it was a 12-issue series. It had... A, like Over a, four months. Yeah, it had a few tie-in series, but it was also the X-Men books for, like, the entire time, and the Avengers books for the entire time. And I just remember it being, and maybe, you know, six or seven years ago, Dale would quickly dispute this. I remember it being something that retained its readership through the duration. It didn't have that period where people were like, I don't care anymore. I think that was because of the accelerated schedule. Yeah, but even War of the Realms, which was only three months, um, that thing, the main series did fine, but after the first three weeks, no one cared about the tie-ins at because all. Because they read them. Those AVX ones were not all killer, man. <laughs> like Some of yeah. them were pretty filler. Yeah, I guess I, I, this is a whole different topic, but a Thor event versus an X-Men and Avengers event. Yeah. So yeah. well, you could say, no, this was, an, this was an Avengers event, too. Yeah, but. Yeah, but not really. All right, so, there. we. Uh, those are answers. I think those are good answers. And, yes. So, here's a question that I've posed in the store a few times, and uh, it was, uh, you seem to get almost angry by it? Like, not angry, but, like, like no, you're totally wrong. Probably angry. Uh, I question... And I'm not saying that I believe this, uh-huh. but I question the accessibility uh-huh. of longtime X-Men fans of House and Powers. Re- I, can I can think, you rephrase the question? Yes, the construction I of it confuse me. think that there is a, not a large, but a, a decent section of X-Men fan base that may not understand this book. And it may not be the X Men book they're looking for. Uh, I grant you that these are have both been phenomenal issues, and they're doing really well so far. I just wonder how, like, more toward younger readers or people that grew up in the X Men cartoon. Okay. If they jump into House of X number one, if it's going to resonate for them. And I asked this in the store to you and Ryan Voss, mm-hmm. and you both just said yes. Yes, it's going to work for them, yeah. I mean, some of it is just evidential. Like, I've seen people of all different kinds of X-Men readers, brand new to long time, everyone's adding it, everyone's reading it, everyone's loving it. I asked a bunch of people Wednesday and Thursday when they were picking up Powers 10, like, hey, did you get a chance to read House of X number one? Yes, they all read it. They were so psyched. Multiple people told me that they were rearranging their schedules to get to the comic shop earlier in the week now because they 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 did not want to have anything ruined on social media. And that alone tells me that this thing is working for a lot of people. I, I just think from my experiences, talking to people about the book and seeing the way they're responding to it and adding it to their subscriptions, that it's clearly working kind of for everybody. I don't think I've had yet one person tell me that they read it and didn't like it or had no interest. The people who 
are X-Men fans who aren't buying it, the only reason they're not buying it is because they... They've been hurt before. No, because they read trades only. Like, I've... They've told me to my face that they don't read single comics. They're incredibly excited about it, and it's kind of killing them a little bit to not read it, but they can only read it in trade. They're not going to buy so, a single I'm issue. sorry. Did somebody already say they know how this is going to be collected? I think somebody had mentioned they'd read something somewhere that they thought they saw how it was going to be collected, but I, they didn't offer any like okay. link to something. How do you think it's going to be collected? I think it's got to be one big book. You could do it in in two chunks. You couldn't do it house in one book and powers in another book. It's not going to make much sense. Right. That's the weird part about it. But you could do it like Act 1, Act 2. You could do it that way. Sure. Or more likely Act 1, Act 2, Act 3 and do it in three books. But... It makes more sense to put it into one, but obviously if they do, they do it a hardcover first. Probably. That's, and, that's how they did No Surrender and No Road Home. And since those, this is a weekly series, they're all coming out quick enough that it's yeah. not like a I think it'll be done by between. the middle of October. Yeah. Um, yeah, when they did the Uncanny X-Men Disassembled, that was uh, ten issues. Two of them were oversized. One book. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I can't understand why they would want to split up House and Powers into two different books, and especially I would assume... if they alternate and, and include... Elements of, like, if if you just read Powers of Ten number one, there's a sequence where Mystique and Magneto and Charles Xavier are in a scene together. The setup for that is last week's House of X number one. Right. It's going to make zero sense if you just start with Powers of Ten number one. I mean, you're, you're pretty presumptuous saying that it's Charles Xavier, but I'll let that slide. For the sake of an, <laughs> an abbreviated podcast, I'm not going to toss in any fan theories or my own theories about what's going on. Sure. I'm just going to say Charles Xavier because that's what they call him in the scene. Yeah, yes, yes. We'll leave it at that. He's got a big X on his head. He does. And again, they specifically call him Charles Xavier in the scene. If you want to hear quotes around Charles Xavier when I say it, that's fine too. I think it's Joseph. Okay. <laughs> I, I, do, I do not think it's Joseph. I think it's all of the X babies standing on each other's shoulders. And Dal, uh, what can you tell Contest of Challenger listeners about... House of X, Powers of Ten, and the upcoming X-Men series. What does it hold? What has it become to Challengers? Oh, collectively, those books, starting, I think, with House of X, and then X-Men, and then Powers of Ten, are our most subscribed to titles at Challengers now, officially. They worked their way up the list over the last few weeks. At one point, they were just beneath Batman as the most subscribed to currently active series, which means Saga was still at the top, but it's not actively being published, so it didn't really count. But now, as of Powers of Ten number one, those three books have eclipsed Saga now as our most subscribed to titles, full stop. And only uh, only increasing. Yeah, for sure. And I want to reiterate that if you are down for House of X, you are automatically going to get the X-Men series. Yeah. Because technically House of X and Powers of Ten are the prelude to X-Men. Yeah. So unless you tell us otherwise, we're going to assume you want the Jonathan Hickman X-Men comic. There are still a few people that do not want Powers of Ten. They just want House of X. Yeah. Even though which, we tried to tell them that you're literally reading half the story. It's your prerogative. It's, it's not for us to tell you how to yeah. how to read your comics. I, I can't force them to get it, but I can tell them why I think it's an, a misguided decision that they will come to regret. So, speaking of, and thank you for this wonderful segue you're into welcome. misguided decisions that you're going to regret. Uh, this is a thing that I actually already shared with you. Okay. But I want to share it with the people that listen to this podcast. Mm -hmm. It is an article, and hopefully you can definitely hear air quotes around my use of the word article. Article. Called, The Disturbing Trend, Retail Comic Pricing. <laughs> You did share that with me. I yes. was really interested to read it. Yes. And that was fun. first of all, I'm going to break the cardinal rule of journalism and not tell you who wrote this or where I found it. But I'm comfortable doing that because I'm not a journalist. Yeah, there's a, a, a blog I follow on Tumblr for a guy named... Uh, the blog is called Ask a Game Dev. So he's a game developer that wishes to remain anonymous so he can answer questions. And when people come to him with hey, I saw this thing on YouTube, he'll respond to it, but he won't link to it if he disagrees with it. Because he's right. like, I don't want to give this thing more traffic. Right. And that's kind of what this is about. Yeah. That's why I think it's fair not to mention it. Uh, it's it's not very long. I'm going to read it in its entirety. Okay. And 
it's in the first person, so they're going to say I, and I don't mean me. I'm saying the author of this piece. Somebody on eBay just ordered a Gustavo Duarte print. Good for them. Cool. Yeah. Maybe they picked up Dear Justice League this week and said, I want to know more about this guy. Maybe. I won't, I won't also, I sold one last weekend. That's cool. I sold three prints last weekend. Uh, Gustavo, hmm? Brian Wood. Weird. And I can't remember the third one. I've sold a bunch of Gustavos in the store. Like, usually when people see the prints and they're in from out of town, like, they'll buy a few, and Gustavo is usually one of them. Uh, anyway. We, we hope to have something really nice to talk about with Gustavo uh, around November, sure. but we'll see. Anyway. I have noticed a disturbing trend among retailers. Overpricing. Apparently, not happy with the sales prices from the Overstreet price guide, many have abandoned it altogether. Where have they gone for their new pricing models? Mostly to eBay by studying the last several sales figures, they use these as current pricing in their retail shops. Now, that would be understandable if they just limited their pricing to trends, but instead, these folks have decided to price raw copies at, wait for it, yep, you guessed it, slabbed graded comic book prices. I'm going to jump in here real quick and define the term raw because I don't think this guy does. Raw basically just means a comic that's not in a CGC slab. Yeah, I comment off the shelf. Also, I'm obviously putting a lot of inflection to this. You are. I don't think I'm wrong to do so. No. Now, this has two major impacts on the market. Number one, prices skyrocket. Number two, formation of a bubble. Two years ago, most retail establishments used the latest Overstreet Guide for value pricing. This would always give the speculators a 20% to 30% roughly lower price as the Overstreet Guide is about 18 months behind actual pricing. Two years later, and most of the retail establishment has begun using other services, like GPA, that data crunch the numbers. In order to get in on the current pricing, they are charging slab prices for raw books. How can you tell that a comic book is overpriced? I looked at a raw copy and then add the shipping and CGC cost to confirm the actual price I'm paying for a comic. Let's focus on brick and mortar here. The following example shows the danger of paying too much for a raw comic priced as if it were CGC slabbed. CGC Amazing Spider-Man 300 in grade 9.0, the average price is $350. The total cost to buy CGC book, $350. Versus raw copy Amazing Spider-Man 300 in grade 9.0, the retail price may look like a good deal at $325 in raw format, but watch out. Retail cost, $325, plus shipping, $20, plus CGC Modern, $20, plus CSC Press, $12, equals $377. Let's do a Bronze Age example, too. How about something with a Mike Zek cover? Sound good? Well, Secret Wars number 1 is still relatively cheap and marks the end of the Bronze Age for some. Hypothetically, if we were to enter a retail shop and purchase a raw copy, supposedly in 9.2 at $48, then this purchase is a straight-up market purchase. You are literally purchasing at the market for a near mint minus 9.2 grade. CTC copy Secret Wars number 1 in grade 9.2, the average price is $48. FMV. That's when I looked at you like, Hey, what is FMV? Full market value. I figured it out. Okay. Therefore, the total cost to buy a Bronze Age CGC slab book, $48, versus raw copy of Secret Wars number one in grade 9.2 with the same price point as above, $48, plus shipping, $20, plus CGC, $27, plus pressing, $27, equals $122. Uh, are pressing... Also CGC causes? I don't know what that is. Hmm. Okay. When you buy a raw copy, it is so important that you pay below the current market price so with adjustments for getting it slabbed. Otherwise, you'll be in the red for quite a while. The two examples above make it imperative that you try to negotiate and leverage your local retailer in order to get a fair price. The pricing problem is big, but the grading problem is giant size. How many retailers are starting to fudge the line between near mint minus and fine plus? With bad grading and overpriced raw comics, the environment for speculators is like hopping through a minefield to get a good deal. It is much tougher than years past. 
My advice is to hold off on big purchases and bundle your purchases to leverage the largest discount when purchasing. Every speculator should be developing leads and looking for alternative prices to purchase comics in addition to your local retailer. That is the sum total of the article. And may I just say, fuck off. Yeah, good riddance. Um, when you sent me the link to that, I think I said that I could not have cared less if the entire market exploded and took everybody involved with it. Yeah. Um, I think everything the guy's talking about in there is idiotic. I think it's all a detriment to comics as an art form. I could not care less about the market being unfair to speculators in any way. But wait, if play, this thing play is the worth stock $48, market. Play the stock and you market. buy it for $48, how do you make money? I don't care if you make money on comic books. I mean, Jesus Christ, look at the way I make a living. Yeah, I, I could not have any less interest or empathy for people who try to make money buying and selling comic books as though they were again like playing the stock market like that I, I find that at best dispiriting and at worst reprehensible comic so book stores don't care have such a, a low don't markup care. compared to any other type of merchandise uh -huh. and this person is basically saying how dare they charge a price that is what everyone else says this is worth yeah he they they make the, a point of saying I liked it better when they were 18 months behind yeah, the pricing trend the prices are going up and it's harder for me to make money Stop trying to make money this way. Like, I, I, again, no sympathy. No empathy. I could not Look, care less. If, if you buy comics from investments, fine. If you buy comics from investments from us, fine. But you can't get mad at us for selling a, a book, which we almost never do, mm -hmm. for what the current market value is. Because that's the current market value. Yeah. How many other industries have... And, and this is honestly a conversation that I had with uh, someone else that I was going to talk to you about. Okay. But basically, we're going to use the term surge pricing. Sure, okay. Like, you can go to your favorite restaurant at lunch and at dinner and order the same thing. It's more expensive at dinner. Probably, yeah. And that is an example of surge pricing. Yeah. The demand is higher at dinner for a table, so they're going to charge a little bit more. The demand is less at lunchtime, so they're going to charge a little less to try and fill more tables. That's how kind of supply and demand works. How many stores do we know of that, you know, there's a store that we talk about often in our area that surge prices. Sure. Everyone's looking for this book. The demand is that, like, we, we have fewer copies, so the price goes up. Yeah. In, in a few weeks, when no one cares, we'll lower it again. Yeah. And honestly, like... Once it was defined as surge pricing, I'm like, oh, I, I totally understand more of this. Yeah. And comics, you know, if you come in at 11 o'clock to buy Powers of 10 number one, it's five ninety nine. Mm -hmm. You come in at 6.45 to buy it, it's five ninety nine. Yeah. We, we don't, be, I mean, we also have a printed cover price on it, but that doesn't matter. We could upcharge if we want. Plenty of stores do. Yeah, I, I don't... I understand it. I just dislike how the market as it is now is normalizing that sort of behavior. I don't think it's healthy. I don't think it's good for anything other than the collectible end of the market. I think it's bad for literally everybody else. But the fact that the collectible market is exerting such pressure, at, you know, positively or adversely, uh, that it's it's kind of warping what comics retail is into basically just collectibles and I, that bothers me so much like I, I don't like the idea of only looking at comics as cool but how much is it worth like it's my least favorite question when people come in off the street who don't care about comics is what's your most expensive comic book as though that's how you know what the best one is right because that's the expensive one not what's the what's your favorite book or what's popular or what's a good book what's the most expensive book because value is the only arbiter of success yeah, I dislike it. And I, again, could not care less if the people involved in that market lose everything. I don't care. There's a line from the movie Grand Canyon that has always stuck with me. And in Grand Canyon, Steve Martin was a uh, schlock filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And then he had an epiphany, uh, a life-changing moment where he decided, where he realized that everything he's made is garbage and he's only going to make things that matter moving forward. Was Grand Canyon like the big chill? Was it like the yeah, that filmmaker, but, but, but like for, later? Yeah, yeah okay. Lawrence Kasdan. Okay, yeah. 
Danny Glover and Kevin Klein. Sure, okay. And at the end of the movie, he's back to making garbage. Mm-hmm. And somebody calls him on and says, why are you doing this? And he said, what am I, an arbiter of taste? <laughs> People want to see this stuff so they can see this stuff. Arbiter of taste. <laughs> Which I feel like sometimes we are. Kind of, yeah. yeah. I mean, we've talked before about the idea of of curating and how it's necessary in a market that produces way more product than any one store could ever stock. And that means you have to say, okay, this is the stuff I think is good and worth carrying. And this is the stuff I don't and will not. One of the things that has always bothered me about people that want to buy multiple copies or multiple covers, or, you know, I want all X number of like, there's 12 variant covers in this book. I want all 12 Mm -hmm. is my thought would be, why don't you take that money and buy 12 different comics and then you could read more stuff and maybe you'll find something that you really love that you didn't know existed. I, the variant cover but, thing... Hold on. Go, yeah. But the, my, my, what I fail to realize is it's not 12 comics either way. It's I want these 12 books or I'm not buying other comics. Hmm. It's not as if they would buy 12 other comics with that money. They just wouldn't buy comics. Right. Yeah, I... You know, five or six years ago, I was I was definitely more mad at variant covers than I am now. Um, and it was... De- and, and maybe in five or six years, I'll be like, I don't care about collectibles. Let's get in that market, too! As my opinions evolve and or I get tired of being poor. But the, the variant cover thing doesn't bother me so much. Like you said, mostly because it's not as though the people who are buying five or six copies of, of House of X variants... If they only bought one, would suddenly be like, "Hey, what's this Oni book?" Like that's right, right. That which, is not which the is alternative. My pipe dream. Yeah, and and also that we've seen a lot of people who are buying multiple copies of DC and Marvel books are buying a ton of other comics too. Like it, it's their lists are not small, so they clearly are able to keep buying other stuff. And I guess like I'm not the sort of fan that feels better if I have multiple covers of a book I like. But I will acknowledge now in 2019 that there are fans like that. They're not buying them because they think it's going to be worth a ton of money and they're not trying to corner some sort of market. They genuinely like the book and they want to get the various covers of it to demonstrate financially how much they care about this book or the cover artist. Like they do care about it in a, in an artistic way, even if it's not the artistic way that I would care about it. So I, getting mad at them for variant covers feels like getting mad at them because they didn't appreciate a a story the same way I did, which I don't, I never want to do. Right. You don't want to be like, well, you're not a real fan. No. I, so I, I don't, I don't have problems. You didn't see Aztec in the background of this panel. Uh You're not a real fan. Uh Uh-huh. You're not an ultimate man. But the collectible thing is, is different because it's, it's not valuing art at all. It's only valuing a collectible and the money that you can make off of it and the feeling you get making money off of something that is scarce or desirable it's the the hunt the chase the i went to a store and i grabbed the last copy at four bucks and then i put it online and i got 25 for it it's the story that's all you want that's the only story you're interested in it's the story of you making 21 dollars not the story of what's inside the comic book it's the difference between a collector and a collectible yeah and I feel that in the collectible definition, the purchaser feels like they have to win. Sure. But for them to win, someone has to lose. Yeah. (laughs) To quote, I think, Always Sunny, who is this against? Who is this versus? Well, it's certainly not versus you, dear listener, because you obviously have impeccable taste, because you have listened to yet another full episode and for that we thank you for listening keep reading comics 10 more years woof let's see how those uh patrons do next month okay do you know what shove it up your ass <laughs> this has been contest of challengers thanks for listening keep reading comics challengers is located at 1845 northwestern avenue in the bucktown neighborhood of chicago 773-278-0155 Keep up to date with new releases and events at challengerscomics.com. Like Challengers Comics on Facebook, follow at Challengers on Twitter, and help fund this podcast at patreon.com slash challengers.